the essence of Beethoven's dramas is not in the material so much as in their special place within the, within the time plan of the work. For much of Beethoven's greatness has to do with this unique sense of the fitness of things in time. Beethoven, as an architect, was not especially concerned with perfection of shape, with that uh, rhyming algebraic balance which a Mozart work might have. In Beethoven's mature works, there are almost no pat formulas, no stock answers. Beethoven willfully admits the ugly, the unwieldy, as an artistic factor, and perhaps because he did not pursue mathematical perfection, he achieves something more. He achieves inevitability. Ever since I was a small boy, almost my greatest joy in making music has been the um, exercise of improvisation, of sitting down at a keyboard and trying to imitate the styles of earlier composers. And in doing this, it wasn't long before I made a discovery, which I think would be acknowledged by most other chronic improvisers. I discovered that Beethoven was just about impossible to imitate. I might set myself a few subject, uh, such as might confront um, Handel or a sonata development in the manner of Haydn, and whatever the overall quality of the piece might be, as I turned it out, they would undeniably uh, be able to place the fugue answer where Handel would likely have placed it or to develop a stretty that was Haydn all the way. But the one composer who was impossible to answer for remained Beethoven. And no matter how hard I might try, I always ran into this same wall. There was just no knowing what Beethoven would have done. Beethoven's education was, of course, an 18th century education, and his early years are coincident with the high tide of what we call classical tonality. For in the, in the latter half of the 18th century, the language of tonality, the language of key relationship, was simplified. Its working vocabulary became almost wholly a, a vertical, a harmonic one. And meantime, the, the horizontal dimension of music, the combination of, of uh, melodic voices, was less a way of life than it had been for the 17th century or than it was for that magnificent nonconformist Johann Sebastian Bach. And the vertical dimension, the sum of these melodic movements, took on more and more a quality of mathematical certainty. <laughs> that chords set up one to the other became almost um, psychologically predictable. One grew to expect certain things going out of certain other things. Dissonance did not any longer need to be the sum of uh, many voices aroused to conflict within themselves, but it could also be a, a sudden convulsive force. Sort of lightning streak in a clear sky. This was the age, and this was the musical temper, which gave us the classical sonata and the classical symphony, musical forms which, uh, in their way, reflect the rational outlook of 18th century philosophy, in which the uh, harmonically centered conception of music found its natural outlet. And no one certainly used the tools of 18th century tonality with more conspicuous success than did Beethoven. Now, it would be wrong to suggest that the age of Haydn and of Mozart was wholly oblivious to the old and noble art of joining voices, of writing counterpoint. It was given all the honor that uh, ought to be directed to a scholastic discipline. It was even considered rather valuable for stretching the minds of the very young. But as Mozart himself commented to a young tenor who felt his mind in need of stretching, you already possess the greatest gift, that of melody. You have no need of learning counterpoint. Mozart was not quite our idea of a progressive educator. Beethoven's approach to counterpoint became throughout his life more integral. His use of line and combinations of line began to have, if not, if not wholly a life of their own, certainly a, a direct relation to the harmonic language. And this harmonic result, in turn, made possible new conquests by creating dissonance through a confluence of lines, a meeting place of parts, uh, harmonic factors which would be almost impossible to explain without this kind of linear joining, linear preparation, became available for use. And so it was that with Beethoven, with the late Beethoven, the art of ages past, the art of writing counterpoint, was being restored to music. This is part of the wonderful fugue from the Hummer Clavier Sonata. Of course, Beethoven's counterpoint doesn't really resemble the Baroque masters. For one thing, it's not as continuous as, as Bach's counterpoint, for instance. It's not as inseparably bound up with the rhythmic pulse of the music. 
but neither is it academic counterpoint designed as a sort of cloak to be put on for special occasions, to be put on for mm, stirring finales and pious curies. No, it is integral counterpoint. It's counterpoint that contributes to and that derives from the harmonic texture of the work. It's counterpoint fitted to the needs of classical structures like the sonata, but modifying by its presence the nature of those structures. Sometimes, because so much happens so quickly, because so much is going on in the late Beethoven scores, the individual movements are often surprisingly brief. The transitions from, from one point to another are no longer um, structurally independent as they seem to be in the sonatas of Mozart, but rather the whole architectural design is compressed, is knit into one indivisible factor. Uh, for example, here's the first movement of, um, the first part of the first movement of Beethoven's Sonata Opus 109. Now, within the space of 15 bars, Beethoven introduces his theme, a sort of chorale. He modulates here. He establishes the new key, the dominant. And he confirms it. Within 15 bars, we've finished the whole first half of that movement. And the granite sculpture of works like the Eroic is now, as you can see, being replaced by much, much smoother profiles. Instead of being struck by great harmonic thunderclaps, we're drawn gently into, a, into an undulating world of harmony and line. Well, now, we've spoken of Beethoven's early works and of his last years, but the cello sonata, which we're going to play, belongs, of course, to neither. It stands at the beginning of the long transition that separated these two periods. And if the decade of Beethoven's 30s, when he wrote the Eroica Variations, was his most productive, certainly that of his 40s was his least productive, these years nonetheless witnessed some of Beethoven's very best work, the Seventh and the Eighth Symphonies, the Piano Sonata in E flat, the String Quartet in F minor. But generally, they're not works which grip us with that same elemental dynamic energy, that force of the Eroica, of the Appassionata. They certainly don't lack energy, witness the Seventh Symphony, but it's a more controlled, it's a, it's a more urbane, sophisticated sort of vitality. For example, the, the scherzo of the sonata we're going to play has that quality. <laughs> This is my good friend, Leonard Rose. Good evening. Leonard, you know, this scherzo often occurs to me has an extraordinary resemblance to the scherzo of the Seventh Symphony. As a matter of fact, I, I think it's practically the same form, is it not? It really is. It has <coughs> repetition in exactly unchanging, no variation at all, and then the short return to the scherzo at the end. It's, in some ways, this sonata is a kind of preparatory exercise for the Seventh Symphony, I suppose. It's, it's, there are so many qualities in the sonata that, that are Beethoven, that, that are the, the dominant qualities of Beethoven's late years that are, that are gradually growing into his works, the, the compression, the sort of truncation of theme. As a matter of fact, uh, I think uh, one of the very few regrets I have about this work is that Beethoven didn't make the slow movement any longer. It's quite yeah. short, almost, I mean, practically an introduction to the last movement. It is. It's almost as if he wanted to write on one plane and one plane only, that of in a sort of allegro mood from beginning to end. I suppose it's all part of his feeling of wanting to make everything all of a piece. And of course, that's the, that's the main thing about Beethoven, that it is all of a piece. Yes, let's let's right. play it. Good. <laughs> 